These images will differ depending on whether you're doing an intracavitary or a transcutaneous approach, but the anatomy is the same. Some of the challenges are going to be to orient yourself to the tonsil, to the tongue, and to the back of the palate. When we think about doing peritonsillar ultrasound, we have to remember that when we ask children to open their mouths and say, ah, our goal is to lift that palate up. When we have a mouth that's closed, the palate is down. And so the tongue actually contacts directly with the tonsil and we can notice the vasculature of the upper neck as well. So this is an intracavitary image and we can tell that because of the uh, curve of the image itself. And line A is measuring the depth to the center of the abscess that they found in this tonsil, while line B is measuring the distance to the cervical vasculature. This is important because we'll talk about the sheath technique for tonsillar aspiration, and it's important to make sure that we're not going to stick our needle so far in that we risk bleed. Here, we have another scan, and this one was done in our own department. So you can see as well, there's an abscess formation in the center of this scan. And the way that we can try to orient ourselves is to see if we can appreciate any bubbles that are forming, suggesting that line between the tongue and the tonsil itself. And then again, looking for that vasculature. So here's another abscess. It looks much like an abscess you would see in soft tissue. You can see the tonsil, the round tonsillar shape in the middle of the image here. But then you're also noticing that kind of dark, hypoechoic structure right in the middle. You see some brightness around the edge of your circle, and that's often a little bit of edge enhancement, sure, but you can also see some movement there. Those are the bubbles of air following along the tongue and around the tonsil itself. In this image, we've done an intracavitary assessment, but we've done it with our microcurvilinear probe. So in our institution, we actually don't have access to an intracavitary probe, but we do have a microcurvilinear for neonatal ultrasound. So in the appropriate patient, we're able to go in and take that same approach as a transcavitary probe, and we're able to me measure to the depth of that abscess with visualization of the vessels around. Once we've calculated our depth, we're gonna go and trim our sheath. We take a spinal needle, but we keep the sheath intact. The goal of trimming the sheath is to create a hard stop so we don't get that vasculature while we uh, aspirate our abscess. Here you can see the laryngoscope and light technique. This is, of course, in a compliant patient that is willing to tolerate this examination. But what it allows is both moving your tongue out of the way and also illuminating the posterior pharynx, allowing you better visualization of that tonsil and that tonsillar abscess. So Mark did this scan, and here you can see a successful aspiration of pus from that peritonsillar abscess in a patient like the one described above. Once you complete your assessment, it's always important to go through and scan again. Make sure that that abscess has gotten smaller. There's not a second drainable pocket there. And depending on your definition of drainage, talk to ENT as well. A lot of questions I get when we're teaching this clinically is how are we going to di differentiate between tonsillar cellulitis and peritonsillar abscess, given that there are probably a couple of different things that we're going to be doing with, with both of those patients. They may both need IV antibiotics, but one may undergo a procedure immediately or within a few days, while the other may wait and see. So one of the papers that we've reviewed shows a couple of really great shots. It's a pediatric radiology paper, so their focus is really on imaging. And I think these two are really nice to talk about because they compare the difference between that sort of expansive crypt-like appearance of a peritonsillar cellulitis, where you still have the architecture of that tonsil there, versus an abscess where you're really losing that internal architecture. And if you practice ultrasounding lymph nodes and lymph node abscesses, it's a similar sort of spectrum that you'd expect to see, but just practice doing the normal side and the abnormal side when you're looking at peritonsillar abscesses to get a better sense of that history. This same paper also suggests a possible algorithm for utilizing ultrasound in peritonsillar abscesses. So here you can say that if your clinical exam is equivocal, you would think about using an ultrasound. And if that was pos positive, you'd think about aspiration. You will note that this does not suggest that if your clinical exam is clearly positive, you necessarily do the ultrasound. Although my argument would be if you're gonna 
create a sheath and drain an abscess, you probably want to know the depth that you are going. Here's another video, and this one is actually of a needle aspirating in the moment. It's a little bit choppy, so I do apologize for that. But you can see the movement of that bright white line, and that's the needle actually entering the abscess. Now, you can do this transcervically as well, but again, it's not really for measurement at that stage. It's really more to do inline visualization of that. We should probably give a shout out to, I believe that video is from uh, Massachusetts General. So, so thank you, Massachusetts General, for that wonderful video. Uh, so remember, intraoral versus transcutaneous approaches. So there's two ways to do this. You want to think about your landmark and your anatomy, and you also want to sheath your needle appropriately. And if you're doing it an intercavitary approach, you want to be sure to talk to your infection control. So our final section is going to be on esophageal foreign body. Those of you who've seen the airway lectures before will be familiar with this image, but what it is is a trachea and an esophagus in transverse view at the base of the neck. We see the trachea as this larger structure that's air filled, so we're getting that shadowing deep to it with a small muscular area just over to the side of it with the esophagus. When we think about foreign body ultrasound of the neck, what we're doing is really utilizing our same airway ultrasound but this time we're focused and looking at that esophagus. Is it dilated? Do we see it consistently moving? And so here you can see an airway and you can see this esophagus popping out, but then there's this large sort of growth to the esophagus with some sort of contents in it. This is what we're trying to look at in terms of whether or not there's a high esophageal impacted foreign body, uh, food bolus, or some other structure that's causing issue there. Just to compare, B is a normal esophagus, and A is a video still of the same video that we just saw. So you can see an increased dilatation, and there seems to be some sort of heterogeneous material in there. If we keep looking, we have other cases that suggest the same. So again, larger prominence of that esophagus with swallowing, not really moving in terms of its shape, looking at that increased caliber diameter, and possibly things such as reverberation present if it's a metallic or glass foreign body. Here you can see a foreign body that was removed from one of our high esophageal foreign body patients, which was in fact a piece of steak. If we go further on, we can try to do some measurements and take a look at our ultrasounds as well. And all of these photos were taken from these two articles looking at pediatric esophageal food impaction and esophageal food impaction in bedside sonography from the American Journal of Emergency Medicine, some of which were done in our institution. So our case for this area is a seven-year-old girl who's complaining of dysphagia and sore throat after choking on a plastic coin a week ago. She's not only taking liquids and soft foods, but has stable vital signs with a normal rest rate and saturations of 99%. So in our institution, what we did was we took a quick look at her upper esophagus, remembering we're not going to be able to see deep to the clavicles. She was pointing directly at the neck, so we thought it was a safe bet to try and look. And as we roll through this clip, you can appreciate the airway or the trachea as your large circular structure on one side, and then a large caliber sort of stationary esophagus that seems to have something inside of it on the other side. Given this presentation and the history, we called ENT who requested a barium swallow. And here, similar to our ultrasound, what we can see is a plastic coin nicely lodged in the esophagus. So remember, airway ultrasound techniques can be used for esophageal foreign body assessment. You wanna sweep up and down, but remember that you won't be able to visualize deep to the clavicles and look for persistent air fluid levels and esophageal dilatation as suggestions of an upper esophageal obstruction.